Okay. Uh, right, yeah, I just wanted to um, talk about the Things Network briefly. Uh, it's all right. I'm sure it'll last. It's not going to die. Until it does, obviously. Um, yeah, I mean, the Things Network. So um, we've mentioned this before at previous events. Um, uh, what is it? The Things Network is a community of over 13,000 people in 84 countries building a global Internet of Things data network. That's what it is. Um, and every day that number goes up. There's a, the th if you go to the thingsnetwork.com, there's a platform that shows you how many communities there are and, and how many different cities are, um, are doing this. Um, and so these networks, uh, so they use two technologies. They use LoRaWAN, long-range uh, wide area network protocol for long-range stuff, and they use Bluetooth 4.2 for short-range stuff. Um, and so this is a technology that allows things to talk to the internet without using 3G or Wi-Fi. Um, so yeah, so so yeah, so it's a it's a, a network of networks. Um, it, it all started uh, in Amsterdam. Um, about three years ago, I think, where some people got together um, to uh, experiment with LoRaWAN gateways and see what they could do with them. And they realized that to do kind of city scale applications and prototyping, they needed to, to have a, a bunch of gateways distributed uh, uh, in the city, talking to each other and allowing you to place sensors in the environment that can communicate with those gateways and deliver data to wherever you're storing your data and evaluating it. Um, and so they, uh, this is not a commercial operation, this is a bottom-up, grassroots, community-driven um, uh, process. And uh, in Amsterdam, they crowdsourced um, their city-wide LoRaWAN network in six weeks. So from a couple of people getting together in a pub saying we should create a uh, a, a network for everyone to use in Amsterdam to having, I think they had um, five or six nodes around the city. Um, the different gate, the, the technology comes in different sizes, so some of the, the bigger gateways are more expensive and have a range of about seven miles. Um, the smaller ones are much cheaper, sort of two or three hundred euros, have a range of about three kilometers. Um, but you don't need many of these things to cover um, you know, city centre, certainly, and even and wider. Uh, obviously, you've got interference from um, the built environment to contend with, but um, generally speaking, you know, LoRaWAN penetrates quite a lot of stuff. It's low energy, low bandwidth, so you know, you're not going to be streaming video over these things, but you do have enough bandwidth to be sending packets of data from sensors every so often. Uh, and Bluetooth 4.2, of course, is for short range stuff. Um, it's what you use, isn't it, right? I don't know, to be honest. I wondered that as well. I yeah. <laughs> I wonder what, I mean, I've just got that off their website. Um, and I wasn't, I didn't have time to look up what Bluetooth 4.2 protocol was, but yeah. I'm assuming it's LE, because why wouldn't it be? Well, I don't think it's the same thing. I mean, Bluetooth, Bluetooth, LE, right? Right. right. It might be the blue VFD, but it's a okay. subset. Alright. Yeah, we'll have to, have, have, to have to check to see whether. But I'd imagine that Things Network are using Bluetooth LE for some of their networks where they're, where they're doing long, you know, short range stuff. But I mean, to be honest, it was predicated on doing long range stuff in the first place. I think most communities are building LoRaWAN networks rather than. What would be interesting with Bluetooth is Bluetooth mesh that's coming out, which is something to massively extend. Right, range, range of Bluetooth, yeah, by daisy chaining everything together. <laughs> Do you know what the price for Amsterdam was, roughly? Price? I don't know what there. Because we know someone with four million pounds to spend, don't we? <laughs> four million? That's <laughs> <laughs> someone with two million pounds to yeah. spend. <laughs> <laughs> That's the research I'm asking. Okay, so these are the core principles of the um, Things Network. So the principle number one is endorse the manifesto. Um, which means you have to read the manifesto. I'm not going to re um, reproduce the manifesto here. It's all very Dutch. Um, it, the material is open for anyone. 
Uh, people are the foundation of the community, not gateways. So it's about the communities more than it is about the, the infrastructure, although obviously it is about the infrastructure. Um, regular social contact is the driving force of the community's development, uh, and diversity is crucial. So it's a very kind of human, social um, movement, uh, basically to empower communities to take some control over the technology um, and uh, you know, for what end is a question that we can kind of talk about. Um, so the, the Things Network Manifesto it has a bunch of stuff in it that's worth reading if you join the network and become part of it. But the, the key clause is this one. Anyone making use of the network is allowed to do so for any reason or cause, possibly limited by local law, <laughs> fully at own risk, and realising that services are provided as is, and may be terminated for any reason at any moment. The use may be open for anybody, limited to customers, commercial, not for profit, or any other fashion. So it supports a whole load of different business models, but if your business model relies on it being resilient and robust, then um, you might want to reconsider. Uh, I think that network provides not pose restrictions upon its users, so it's an, it's an open network, um, obviously designed for prototyping and for people trying out new, new technologies and applications. Um, and really, it's kind of like a, you know, for people to experiment with, it's like a hobbyist thing, like people that are into the technology to set this up and see what it can do. So there's a big learning um, component of it. Um, so there's learning, understanding how these technologies work and having a platform where anyone can connect to it and try, try applications out. Obviously, the teaching as well. Um, maybe it can be used at universities or in the schools to, to show kids how this stuff is really being done kind of like in parallel to what is being done commercially out there, we can actually do it and show how this technology really works and what, and, and, uh, what its capabilities are. Um, it provides a platform for, for permissionless innovation. Obviously, you know, that's what the internet once was, um, and the internet of things isn't, because most of the internet of things platforms are proprietary platforms that are gated um, you can't just run any application you want on them. So this is basically like recreating the wild west of the internet in the internet of things. Um, so it's really useful for prototyping and it's really useful for advocacy because you can actually show policymakers what this kind of stuff can do. You can do things quite cheaply, do prototypes, do pilots, do trials, show, show organisations and institutions how differently they could operate if they, if they even thought about using 